Good afternoon or good morning or good evening to everyone wherever you are. And these are the, the second of the Deary Lectures uh, 2023 from the Oxford Centre for Buddhist Studies in associ association with the Damachai International Research Institute, to whom we thank greatly for their support for these lectures. So this is the, the second lecture entitled Meditation. I could have been more specific with that. But um, at some point, I'd like towards the end of the lecture to really get into what the practice of early Buddhist meditation means. At the beginning, I just would like to restate a few things from the previous lecture. I talked a lot in the last lecture about Buddhist myth and about Buddhist myth being poetically and spiritually true. Um, I suppose that might be a bit misleading. I think the, the myth of the Buddha, the, the, the classical story of the Buddha received from Buddhist India, most probably has lots of um, true historical elements. So the Buddha's childhood in Kapilavatu, his fact that he is from the Sakya clan, the names of people that come from this clan, such as his father, Suddhodana. I think there must be lots of truth in this. But the myth itself, the myth of the Buddha's renunciation, enlightenment and mission, is very hard to separate out what we might call history from poetical spiritual meaning. So in the last lecture, I focused on what I called outliers and implicit meaning as a way of getting behind the text. The text tell us things um, that are hard to understand. They speak in a different language to us, literally, but they, I think, there's a lot going on between the lines. And to try and get bring that out, to, part, to go beyond the poetic or spiritual meaning is what I was trying to do. So I mentioned in particular the Godika Sutta from the Sangutta Nikaya as a, an outlier, something that stands very much apart from the, the general um, content of the early Buddhist canons of all traditions, something that can't really be in a can't really be explained or has not yet been explained academically. In this text, the Buddha is involved in a, a strange discussion with the demon tempter Mara. And the Buddha and Mara are playing against types. Mara is trying to intervene to stop a bhikkhu committing suicide. The Buddha is saying that you have no need to do that because disciples of the Buddha, they, they, do not desire life. So the Buddha justifies Godika's suicide and Mara intervenes to try to stop. And this type of mythic language, I think, is trying to tell us something. There's some sort of code going on here that this is an unconventional text composed by unconventional early Buddhists. The unconventional aspect of this text is that the Buddha approves of, of Godika's suicide in the sense that he says Godika has, in suicide, in death, has realized final nirvana. So Godika is this person who does not wish to fall away from his high meditative attainment, his temporal liberation of mind. He dies through suicide. The Buddha says that he has attained liberation. In other words, his meditation is an anticipation of liberation. That is what the text seemed to be saying. And I related this idea to the meditative ideas of early Brahminism, which ultimately stem from the early Upanishads. Now, it could be objected to this that I'm getting rather a lot out of a single text. Um, I'm claiming those, these, these, this is a fragment of a hidden history that is there in the Buddhist text, but we don't know how to read them. But I could be... Um, accused of reading too much into the text, of course. Another critique could be that I'm making claims about Pali, the Pali text, the Pali canon, especially the suttas and comparable um, early Buddhist canons in different languages of different Buddhist traditions. I'm making the assumption that they are older than what we know they, they might be. So what I would like to do here is flesh out the view of early Buddhism by drawing more attention 
you know, drawing together more strands of tradition from the Pali canon, from the Pali suttas today. I want to argue that early Buddhism was closely aligned with a meditative tradition of, of Kosala, one of the, the main kingdoms in the lifetime of the Buddha. I want to say that this tradition and this um, form of spirituality was very much different from what was going on in Magadha, which is Magadha and Kosala are the two main kingdoms at the time of the Buddha's life. Ultimately, Magadha dominates northern India. And maybe we read Buddhism very much in the light of that. But I will argue that early Buddhism um, is emerging specifically from Kosala, is specifically in contact with a non-Buddhist meditative tradition, which is coming from the Brahminic tradition. So I'm going to really, what I'm saying is that this is very much different from the textbook view of how Buddhism began. Most textbooks will say that Buddhism was a religion of Magadha. It will say that, of course, the Buddha's enlightenment was in Magadha. Most of, some of the most important Buddhist monasteries at that time were in Magadha. Ashoka, the king of Magadha, became a Buddhist. After Ashoka, Buddhism spreads across India. It is very widely spread across northern India by this time, but Ashoka makes a great uh, difference. So the, the Magadhan connection with early Buddhism is, is very strong. It's strange, however, that when we read the Pali suttas and their Chinese or Tibetan parallels or Sanskrit parallels, Buddhism is mostly set in Kosala and its capital, Savati. The enlightenment of the Buddha is said to take place in Uruvela, which is modern Bodh Gaya. But there's, in the Pali corpus, the Pali suttas, there's not a single reliable text that locates the Buddha in Uruvela any time after the enlightenment. It's a one-off visit, apparently. So this um, a theory of a coastal and origin of Buddhism will change a lot of the ways we think about early Buddhism. Now, the, the Magadhan theory of early Buddhism has been expanded and reformulated recently by Johannes Bronkhorst with his Greater Magadha thesis. I will be explicitly challenging and trying to refute that. Just to put in geographical perspective, let me right, bring up my screen. And here is a map. I hope everybody can see this of showing India and that box in the, the northeast corner roughly corresponds to the area in which the Buddha lived, taught in the fifth century BC. So if you can see, I hope the text is big enough, you see the bottom right hand corner that it says awakening at Uruvela. So Uruvela is down in the bottom right hand corner, that is the kingdom of Magadha. The next bit of text moving up, the first sermon at Isipatana. So that is near Benares. Benares is on the way north. Going further north, we have the place of the Buddha's death, Kusinara, and further north again, Lumbini. So in the far, in the top left corner of this, this box is the, the, the city of Kapilavatu, the city of Savati, very close together. And Kosala stretches down all the way in the Buddha's lifetime to Benara's work. So where the text says Isipatana, Kosala is a, a very considerable kingdom. Magadha is in, not yet achieved its preeminence. That is the geographical region we're talking about. Now this, the, that entire region in that box that we were just looking at, is what has been described by Johannes Bronkhorst as Greater Magadha. So a quite influential thesis, if, we, if I just read out that second paragraph, Greater Magadha covers Magadha and its surrounding lands, roughly the geographical area in which the Buddha and Mahavira lived and taught. 
With regard to the Buddha, this area stretched by and large from Shravasti, the capital of Kosala in the northwest, to Raja Griha, the capital of Magadha in the southeast. This area was neither without culture nor religion. It is in this area that most of the second urbanization of South Asia took place from around 500 BC onwards. It is also in this area that a number of religious and spiritual movements arose, most famous among them, Buddhism and Jainism. Bronkhorst's Greater Magadha Thesis tries to locate all of the um, renunciate meditative um, religions of the Buddha's life and afterwards to this region that Bronkhorst calls Greater Magadha. It's specifically a non-Vedic world that he is locating this religion and culture in. So all of these ideas that are so important in early Buddhism, such as karma and rebirth, meditation, liberation, they're coming from a non-Vedic source in a non-Vedic part of India. And just to bring it, the map up again, so the non-Vedic part of India Bronkhorst is talking about is roughly that box. That is what roughly corresponds to the area in the, the top left-hand corner, which would be Savati, down in the bottom right-hand corner, Rajagaha. That's where the Buddha lived and moved. That for Bronkhorst is Greater Magadha. That was a non-Vedic area. Karma, rebirth, renunciation, liberation, all of these fundamental aspects of Indian civilization, they come from this non-Vedic world. And just another map, which is not entirely accurate, but it gives the political map of India a little bit more clearly. 600 BC is, too, is much too old for this. Um, but Magadha is roughly in the right place, Kashi roughly in the right place. So the Buddha's enlightenment takes place somewhere under the, the word Kashi on your screen. And in fact, the kingdom of Kosala in the Buddha's lifetime is not where it's stated on this map, but roughly where it's, you have the, um, the, king, the Mala kingdom. So in other words, you have Kosala to the north and Magadha to the south. Magadha is to the south of the Ganges, Kosala is to the, the north. Bronkhorst is saying that the region of Greater Magadha is sort of towards the right-hand side of this map. And towards the left, you have the kingdom of Kuru and Panchala. That is the Vedic world, especially between the two rivers, the Ganges and Yamuna River. That's the Vedic heartland. The Buddha was in a different part of India. He didn't get any of his ideas, um, his spiritual or cultural or um, intellectual ideas from Brahmanism or the Vedic tradition. Now, the problem with Bronkhorst's, the problem with Bronkhorst's Greater Magadha Theory, I mean, lots of problems with it. it it draws a very black and white cultural map of ancient India, one which I don't think really corresponds to what we find in the early Buddhist texts. So one simple example would be one of the primary Buddhist texts, um, second sutta of the Diga Nikaya is the Samanyapala Sutta. In the Samanyapala Sutta, which is set in Rajagaha, it begins with King Gajata Satu of, of Magadha asking who on a moonlit night, a full moon night, who can he visit and pay his respects to? Which holy man can he go and see? People say, come out with a standard list of six ascetics associated specifically with Magadha, such as Mahavira, Makali Gosala, and he, the king says, oh, I've seen them. I'm not really fond of them. And then one of his, um, his physician, in fact, Jivaka Kamara Bhatja, he says, well, what about the blessed one? And it's, this is the Buddha. King Ajata Satu has not heard of the Buddha. He doesn't know who he is. The Buddha is unknown. 
And I, I think according to the commentarial tradition, this event takes place towards the end of the Buddha's life. It, it has to if we're dealing with the characters, uh, the character of Ajata Satu. Now, I'm not making the claim that this is a historical, um, reliable information we have here, but it's worth noting that early Buddhists were willing to write a text such as this. Early Buddhists assumed that the Buddha was not well known in Magadha towards the end of his career. Now, let me bring back my screen. I just would, I'm not going to, I want most of what I will say to be a positive critique in terms of constructing an actual thesis rather than spending my time criticizing Bronkhorst. But I will just say, um, for example, this is the type of argument that you will find in Greater Magadha. So the claim that is made here is the term Parivraja in an early Brahminic text, the Arpastamba Dharma Sutra, is connected with non-Vedic ascetics only. This agrees with the use of the corresponding term Paribhajika in the Pali Canon, which refers throughout to non-Vedic ascetics. Now, if we open up the Pali Canon and look, we don't have to go very far. We just turn to the first page of the Sutta Pitaka and what do we find? We find the Brahmajala Sutta introduced as follows. At one time, the Blessed One was traveling along the road between Rajagaha and Nalanda, together with a large community of mendicants, 500 strong. The wanderer, Supiya, was also traveling along the same road, together with his pupil, the Brahmin student, Brahmadatta. So the very first page of the Sutta Pitaka refutes what Bronkhorst has said on page 91 of Greater Magadha. Pari Bajikas, wanderers, are not specifically non, they're not specifically non-Vedic ascetics. They include clearly ascetics coming from the Vedic tradition. Now, maybe the response to that would be, well, there are different types, there are different currents within Brahminism. There might be the Vedic traditional stronghold to the West, and maybe there are strange things happening with unorthodox thought of, for example, that you find in the early Upanishads. But that is not a distinction which you will find in Greater Magadha. It is a distinction that I will draw in this lecture. So the first page of the Brahmajala Sutta is showing that Brahminic wanderers are somehow closely, they're, they're traveling with the Buddha. Buddhists are writing a text and they feel quite happy mentioning a Buddhist, um, a Brahminic teacher and his Brahminic student, sort of in the entourage of the Buddha. The teacher is criticizing the Buddha strongly and his student is praising him. That doesn't seem a strange thing for Buddhists to be saying in early Buddhist texts. I think this is sort of like the tip of the iceberg of what is really happening here, is that the early Buddhist tradition in this world, especially in Kosala, is emerging amongst uh, a, a spiritual culture stemming from the Brahminic tradition. Now, just to show you what I'm, where exactly I think the Brahminic tradition I'm talking about is situated textually. This is from Patrick Olivelle's translation and text of the early Upanishads. It organizes Vedic literature into their different schools and different phases. And unsurprisingly, it is the Upanishads that we are most are most relevant to early Buddhism. So the final phase of Vedic authorship, um, especially the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, we will come to that. The ideas that uh, precede Buddhism, which explain why there was a meditative tradition from which Buddhism emerged, 
they are in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. So Patrick Olivell on the authorship of the early Upanishads. I just want to draw a couple of things, attention to a couple of things here. On the second line, he says that the earliest and some of the earliest and largest Upanishads are anthologies of material that must have existed as independent texts. We have a very complicated literary history, but the key, the key material, which is very close to the early Buddhist tradition, must be circulating outside of the Vedic tradition in the Buddha's lifetime. It hasn't been drawn together into the Upanishads as we know them now. So in the fourth line from the bottom to show how unorthodox this material is, Olivelle points out, it is therefore surprising that several prominent teachers of Upanishadic doctrines are presented as kings, or at least as belonging to the Kshatriya class. So very famously in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, the doctrine of karma and rebirth is received by Brahmins from Kshatriya kings. And there's been a lot of academic debate about what this exactly this refers to. I think it probably isn't controversial to say that somehow the Brahminic tradition, um, that all the, the Brahmins who authored these texts are suggesting that they're not authoring these texts, thinking about these ideas in orthodox circles. At the very least, Brahmins are not in the Vedic world and working out these ideas, karma, rebirth, meditation, and liberation. Whether or not kings did teach Brahmins and Brahminic thinkers, um, that is not the point I wish to make here. The point is that they're presenting a different cultural world as the world within which these ideas were developed. Now, specifically, it is the Brihadaranyaka. That might be very small. I hope you can see that. But within the Upanishads, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad contains material that was drawn together at a much later date, but is certainly much older. The key sections of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad that have material on karma and rebirth, meditation, liberation, they all describe a pre-Buddhist world. We don't have the... This, um, the civilization of the 5th and 4th century BC in these parts of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. We have mainly a pastoral world described with new things, new cultural forces emerging. So this is Olivelle from the early, his early Upanishads again, describing the composition uh, the factors involved in the composition of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. So from the first line, he says, the center of activity in the BU is the area of Videha, whose king Janaka plays a central role together with Yagnya Valkya. Moving on to the, the second paragraph, the, the Kuru Panchala Brahmins considered their land as the place where the best theological and literary activities were taking place. They must have viewed Videha as something of an unsophisticated frontier region. The entire setting of the third and fourth chapters of the Brihadaranyaka was probably intended to show how Yagnivalkya defeated all the best theologians of Kuru Panchala, thus demonstrating not only the preeminence of Yagnivalkya, but also the rising importance of Videha as a center of learning. Now, I think what was going on actually was Brahmins are, are in Videha. They're working out the, these ideas beyond the Vedic heartland. And it's in the, the working out of the, um, the new ideas before the Buddha that we get the culture of renunciation and asceticism into which the Buddha is drawn.
So this is from, again, from Olivelle's early Upanishads. This is his map of northern India um, showing the different Vedic schools. And you will see towards the east, towards the northeast, you have the kingdom of Kosala Videha, and underneath that, BU, which indicates the, um, the Brihadaranika Upanishad. That is the, that is, I think Bronkhorst is certainly right, that that is beyond the Vedic heartland, but certainly it is Brahmins working out ideas in very specifically Brahminic ways. Now, this really matters because the Buddha, by the time of the Buddha's life, the, the Sakya Republic or whatever that might have been, is acknowledged by the Buddha to have been incorporated into Kosala. The Buddha says to King Pasenadi of Kosala that just as King Pasenadi is a Kosalan, so is the Buddha himself. So the authorship of unorthodox thinking in the Brihadaranika in exactly this uh, same geographical location is certainly significant. And here, if you can see, I've superimposed the uh, roughly the area in which early Buddhism emerges here. Under south of the Ganges, the, the southeast corner of this oval shape, that is the kingdom of Magadha. That is where the enlightenment happens. To the northwest, we have Kosala, Savati, the Sakya Republic, and Kapilavatu. All of the key material in the Yag in the Brihadaranyaka occurs in books three and four, which deal with the teachings of the sage Yagni Valkya. So, for example, in especially the, the fourth chapter of book four of the Brihadaranyaka, we have all of the key ideas, karma, rebirth, asceticism, renunciation, and meditation. So this is talking about the self, the, the goal of liberation in early, these early Upanishadic teachings. The final line, it is when they desire him as the world that wandering ascetics undertake the ascetic life of wandering. Certainly a pre-Buddhist text in roughly the geographical world of the Buddha, unconventional Brahmins are talking about what later become called in early Buddhist texts, paribhajikas, wandering ascetics. And then this famous verse, again, just a bit further on from Yagnya Valkyakanda, a man who knows this teaching therefore becomes calm, composed, cool, patient, and collected. He sees the self in just himself and all things as the self. Evil does not pass across him, he passes across all evil. So we have a lot here. All of the Brahminic speculative texts that build on the early Upanishads, all of, I mean, all of the Upanishadic tradition says exactly this sort of thing. He sees the self in himself. That is, in the Moksha Dharma then of the Mahabharata, which developed these ideas further, the same motif describes inner meditation and concentration. The final line of that, evil does not pass across him, is a reference to the, the karma doctrine. So the person who sees the self has destroyed all his karma. I think the text after this goes on to say the, the person who has this, who sees the self, burns away all his evil. So we have karmic ideology burning away your bad deeds, your karma escaping the round of rebirth. So just sorry, just before moving on. In the these Yagna Valkya teachings, which circulated for a long time before being drawn into the Vedic tradition, we have the ideas, the key ideas, karma, rebirth, renunciation, asceticism, and meditation. They're all there in their incipient form. So all of the ingredients are there before early Buddhism 
And you should, if early Buddhism is a religion of this part of the world, is if it is a religion of Kosala, it should mention the same type of traditions if they have not disappeared. So that, that is what we find. So the final sutra of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Indriya Bhavana Sutta, we have mentioned the Brahmin Parasarya and his disciple Uttara, a young Brahmin. When the Buddha asks what Parasarya's teaching is, how does he teach the cultivation of the sense faculties? Uttara tells him, go to Masa. One does not see a form with the eye, nor hear a sound with the ear. And the Buddha replies, in that case, Uttara, a blind person would have cultivated his senses. A deaf person would have cultivated his senses. And the Sutta goes on to give a mindfulness-based teaching about how to respond to experience in the correct manner to progress spiritually. So a Brahminic meditative um, teacher and teaching, uh, inner concentration, cutting off from the world through inner absorption is ridiculed here by the buddha as who says you might as well be deaf and, and blind now contrast this to what is said in the mahaparinibbana sutta just before the buddha's death the buddha is traveling traveling north he is near Kusinara, he's just had the fateful meal from Chunda, and a mala called Pakusa sees the Buddha sitting under a tree in his in meditative posture and is remarks on this that how wonderful and extraordinary it is. And he goes on to say that one time Alara Kalama, a teacher of meditation, claimed not to have seen or heard a caravan of 500 cards passing him by. When Alara Kalama is asked later on whether he was asleep, he says he was not. When he is asked if he was conscious, he's, he assents. He said yes. So this, instead of responding to this in the fashion of the Indriya Bhavana Sutta, where the Buddha ridicules this type of cultivation, the Buddha here says, well, I." the Buddha claims to have gone beyond that. He trumps it by saying that he was once meditating in such a deep trance that he couldn't hear the thunder and lightning that killed two farmers. So anyway, this is the meditative tradition that I am claiming must have existed. The This is a non-Buddhist meditation tradition at the time of the Buddha. Alara Kalama is said to have been the teacher of the Buddha. So this is not just non-Buddhist, it's pre-Buddhist. And it is connected to Brahmin somehow. We have the Brahmin Parasarya and his disciple Uttara. So that dealt with one of the teachers of the Buddha in his in when the Buddha was a bodhisattva striving after awakening, Alara Kalama was one of the teachers. The other teacher of the Buddha, which is mentioned, is a chap called Udaka Ramaputta. And here is one of the fragments relating to Udaka Ramaputta in the Pali Canon, again from the Diga Nikaya, the Pasadika Sutta. So the Buddha reports that Udaka Ramaputta used to speak thus, seeing one does not see, seeing what does one see, one not see. One sees the blade of a well-sharpened razor, but one does not see its edge. A similar type of thing is stated in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, describing the state of awareness in deep sleep. So the text says something like, while he does not see the, he is truly or verily seeing. Though he does not see what is usually to be seen. For there is no cessation of the seeing of a seer because of his imperishability as a seer. Anyway, the, the Pali text, Pasanna Pasati, seeing he doesn't see, is, is basically being lifted from a, uh, a Upanishadic teaching 
Obviously, Udakarama Putta doesn't have a copy of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. These are aphorisms and sayings that are circulating in unorthodox, unorthodox meditative traditions. If we have to locate it anywhere, it surely must be the early Upanishads and unorthodox Brahmanism more widely. Now, how is this tradition dealt with in early Buddhist texts? What, how did the early Buddhists deal with this meditative tradition? Well, the, the fact is that they take over lots of the meditations that are related to this unorthodox uh, tradition of meditation, this pre-Buddhist tradition, and they, they Buddhicize them. So in the Mara Tajaniya Sutta, we have another mythic type of discussion this the the setting for this is that Moggallana is having a discussion with Mara. Uh, Mara has tried to possess Moggallana, but that doesn't matter here. And anyway, Moggallana goes on to outlines a long narrative where he's talking about events in the the lifetime of the former Buddha Kakusanda. So the former Buddha Kakusanda is said to have been a Brahmin by birth, and he had a disciple called Sanjiva. So one time, I will read the text, Venerable Sanjeeva was seated at the foot of a tree, having attained the cessation of perception and sens sensation. Cowherds and farmers going past saw him, and this occurred to them. It's extraordinary and remarkable. This ascetic has died as he was sitting here. Well then, let's burn him. They then piled up grass, logs, and dung over the body of Sanjeeva, set it alight, and went off. When the night had passed, Venerable Sanjeeva emerged from that absorption, dusted down his robes, got dressed, took his bowl and robes, and that morning entered the village for arms. Seeing him wandering for arms, this occurred to those cowherds and farmers, or they in fact probably said this. It's extraordinary and remarkable. This ascetic died while he was sitting down, but here he is, come back to life. And that is how this disciple of Kakusanda, the Brahmin, gained his name Sanjeeva, come back to life, resurrected almost. Anyway, that's not strictly speaking true because he didn't die. So this is a Buddhist mythic, creative way of dealing with this pre-Buddhist tradition. They clearly see that the meditative states connected with um, the pre-Buddhist world, they're somehow mystical or put the, the adept in, in touch with some supernatural reality, such that if one attains it, one would not get burned. Anyway, this, this, um, this type of mystical meditative thinking is a Buddhist adaptation, but I find it interesting still that when they have this mythic rendering of this idea, they connect it with a former Buddha who, one of the former Buddhas who is a Brahmin by birth. So looking more closely then at the story of the, the Buddha's, um, the traditional story of the Buddha, the myth of the Buddha states that before his awakening, he trained in meditation under two teachers, Udaka Alara Kalama and Udaka Ramaputta. Udaka Ramaputta, uh, that is, an, Udaka is an heir of Rama. That is a mistake in the, the first sentence. The main source for this account in the Pali tradition is the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, which is set in the hermitage of the Brahmin Ramaka in Savati. So we have a, a hermitage, the, the modern Indian term used would be ashram. And we also have a hermitage mentioned in the Barandu Kalama Sutta. So this sort of mentions a person called Barandu Kalama who had a hermitage in Kapilavatu. And this Barandu Kalama was a co-religionist of the Buddha. So we have, just in these two texts, we have mentioned 
two hermitages connected to a meditative tradition in Savati and Kapilavatu. And we have four individuals named who seem to have um, a sort of spiritual master-disciple relationship. So we have Rama and his, his heir or spiritual disciple, Udaka Ramaputta, and we have Alara Kalama and someone who comes after him, Barandu Kalama, who is closely related apparently to the Buddha. So I just want to draw some of these things together. I mentioned that the Paribhajika Supiya and his young Brahmin disciple Uttara are mentioned as part of a group following the Buddha as he travels between Rajagaha and Nalanda. There is no divisibility here between the early Buddhist Sangha and its wider relationship to the community of wanderers and Brahmins. In the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, Majjhima 26, the Buddha, it's the whole Sutta is in fact set more or less in the hermitage of the Brahmin Ramaka. The Buddha goes there because there's a number of Buddhist bhikkhus are sitting there discussing the Dhamma. So again, whatever the historicity of this, early Buddhist composers are very happy presenting a Brahminic ashram as a place where in Savati where Buddhists would go and discuss Buddhist teaching and where the Buddha would freely go and talk about his own spiritual path. Then further in a famous incident in the again from the Majjhima Nikaya, the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta, the Buddhist Bhikkhu Sati has an Upanishadic view of consciousness. As I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One, it is this very same consciousness that transmigrates, not another. And when asked by the Buddha, well, what do you mean by this? He says, well, this is the consciousness that speaks and experiences. And the Buddha refutes him. He says that consciousness is dependently originated. This is not my teaching. But we have a world described in the, if we read it closely and carefully, and if we're sensitive to context and location, Buddhist texts very frequently are set within a, the, the events described make it seem as if the relationship between Buddhist, the Buddhist community and the wider ascetic world are sort of um, porous. Ideas are coming from the, ideas and practices are coming clearly from the Upanishads or Upanishad inspired circles. Some Buddhists are getting it wrong. Some Buddhists are borrowing meditative practices from this tradition. And Buddhists are happy, are happy with Brahmins, Brahmin uh, wanderers and ascetics following them about. They're happy going to their ashrams to discuss Buddhist Dhamma. Now, none of this happens with regard to the way the Jains are portrayed in, for, ex in, for example, in early Buddhist texts. The Jain, Jain doctrine is only described in early Buddhist texts, not because of any interest in Jainism per se, but just to refute it. The Jains are people who are doing very wrong things according to Buddha's teaching. The situation is pretty different with regard to the uh, Brahminic ascetics and ideas coming from the Upanishads. The Buddha is clearly, he's described as somebody who is using Upanishadic teaching in a sort of negative way to fashion his own ideas. Some of his followers are getting the wrong ideas, and there is a meditative tradition which is being drawn upon as well. So here is what actually we find in early Brahminic and Buddhist texts. We find that the early Upanishads tell us 
that there are unorthodox Brahminic texts circulating in Kosala Videha, set in a time before the Buddha. It's in these texts that we have for the first time foundational ideas of Indian civilization, karma, rebirth, renunciation, meditation, and liberation. And these texts explicitly criticize the Vedic, orthodox Vedic tradition and Brahmins coming from that. Now, slightly later in date, early Buddhist texts portray figures in a meditative tradition, which seems to be connected with Brahminic hermitages of Kosala. We have these four people, master disciple, Alara Kalama and his disciple Barandu, Rama and his disciple Ramaputta. Other Brahminic meditators are named, Parasarya and his young Brahmin disciple Uttara, the Paribhajika Supiya and his Brahminic disciple Brahmadatta. Buddhists discuss their Dhamma in Brahminic hermitages. Some Buddhists get it wrong and actually hold Upanishadic ideas. Not very surprising if the two worlds are very closely connected. So all of this is um, very much not the impression you would get if you read Johannes Bronkhorst's Greater Magadha. He draws a very sharp distinction between the Vedic tradition and the ascetic renunciate tradition of his this area, Greater Magadha. He doesn't allow for the fact that there might be unorthodox Brahminism. What if Brahmins are highly critical of the old ritual religion? What if they are developing new ideas? What will they do? Well, they will be very receptive to people like the Buddha, charismatic foundational figures around whom a, a new movement emerges. That is what I think really was happening in early Buddhism. From the previous lecture, the, the Buddhist Bhikkhu Godika, therefore, I would locate as a figure in this, in the early Buddhist Sangha, influenced by the non-Buddhist or Upanishadic tradition of meditation. I will also claim that that, that Godika and that influx of ideas and influence can roughly be uh, dated to about the mid fourth century BC, maybe about two to three generations after the Buddha which I will come on to now, not much time left. So um, before I mention the, um, the final part, of, I get into the final part of this lecture, which is the supposed debate between calm and insight in the early Buddhist Sangha. I just wanna say that, that the idea of such a debate, the very fact that there must have been debates in early Buddhism is plausible by this historic, according to this historical reconstruction. If Buddhism is emerging from a particular spiritual world, if it is borrowing certain ideas and practices, it's there will be, if it's using things which are not specifically Buddhist, of course, then there will be debates. And the early Buddhist texts mention a debate, which was described by Louis de la Vallée Poussin in a famous article almost a hundred years ago now. Le Chemin de Nirvana, Musila e Narada. Without being too rash, one may discriminate in the Buddhist sources both ancient and scholastic, between two opposed theories. The theory which makes salvation a purely or mainly intellectual achievement, and the theory which makes salvation the goal of ascetic and ecstatic disciplines. I don't want to go into the insight tradition and what Le Valle, de la Valle Poussin has said about an intellectual achievement. Um, I just would like to hear focus on the other side of his, what he thinks was the debate, the, the calm side, the samatha tradition. So he says, the bottom paragraph here, on the other hand, the path of shamatha, calm, of samadhi, concentration, of the jhanas and samapatis, ecstasies and contemplations, of bhavana, meditation, 
by a gradual purification and the gradual suppression of ideas, this path leads up to a state of unconsciousness, the cessation of all forms of thought, sanya veda yata niroda, or just niroda samapati, which puts the ascetic in touch with a transcendent reality, which is nirvana or like nirvana. Now, there has been a lot of academic debate um, since this, this article was written and lots of things to say about it. I've also written on this debate. Um, you can see here the most relevant recent research, starting with, with Richard Gombrich, the fourth chapter of his important book, How Buddhism Began. That was met with a couple of critiques from Bhikkhu Bodhi, who, and then... Bhikkhu Analio in 2016, all arguing for a more homogeneous early Buddhist tradition in which the texts that we have are not actually describing debate. And responding to Analio in the Journal of the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies, I have written a couple of articles responding, uh, stating, uh, I suppose, uh, continuing the the debate begun by Richard Gombrich in 1996, saying that there very much is an argument. And as you will have seen what I'm saying in this lecture, the reason for the part of the debate is that Buddhists are being influenced by a non-Buddhist um, non meditative tradition. I mentioned earlier that the, the way that these meditative ideas would um, adapted in early Buddhism was in the, this idea of the, the disciple Sanjiva of the former Buddha Kakusanda, who attains Sanya Veda Yita Niroda, this meditative state of complete non-awareness, being completely cut off from the external world. That is the tradition which I think has been influenced by the Brahminic tradition and which calls the debate, which I think we find in the text. So quickly then, a couple of texts on this debate, most, one of the most famous ones, the Mahachunda Sutta, we have two groups disparaging each other, two groups of Buddhists. We have meditators and those applied to the doctrine. Those who are applied to the doctrine or work out the doctrine accuse the meditators of brooding. The meditators accuse those devoted to the Dhamma of being haughty, arrogant, garrulous, full of chatter, with confused mindfulness, lacking full awareness, lacking absorption. So we have meditators and people focusing on doctrine. Maybe something like the difference between a Buddhist meditation center and an academic department of Buddhist studies. And Mahachandas advises reconciliation. He says that each group, he treats each group as equals and say they should respect each other. Now, he says that the meditators should be esteemed or respected because they touch the deathless element with the body. Now, this is a motif specifically which indicates this meditative state of cessation, which is related to the non-Buddhist tradition. In other words, these meditators in the Mahachunda Sutta, they are Buddhists influenced from beyond the Buddhist Sangha by the speculative world of the early Upanishads. The things that were going on in those Brahminic ashrams that I mentioned, things which led the Bhikkhu Sati to get this Upanishadic idea of consciousness, well, they're showing up here in a different form as meditators who touch the deathless dimension with the body. So that is one of the key texts, the Mahachunda Sutta. The other, well, there's the, the another of these key texts is the Kosambi Sutta. Now the Buddha doesn't figure in this text just as the Buddha doesn't figure in the Mahachunda Sutta. So we have a situation where we have a few Buddhists discussing Dhamma. 
The bhikkhu Savita asks Musila whether he knows by himself alone the twelvefold version of dependent origination. And Musila says that he does. Savita then asks Musila if he sees that nirvana is the cessation of becoming. And Musila affirms that he does. Savita concludes that Musila must be an arahant. And at this point, Musila stays silent, indicating that he does regard himself as an arahant. Savita then puts the same questions to Narada. And Narada claims to have the same knowledge of dependent origination. Savita concludes that Narada must be an arahant, but Narada denies it. Narada says that his condition is like that of a thirsty man who can see water at the bottom of the well, but cannot reach it. So although he has knowledge of the water in this metaphor, he cannot touch the water with his body. So Narada's position is clearly a metaphor for touching water with his body is clearly a metaphor for what he cannot do is attain the state of cessation, which is something you attain by touching with your body. So again, Narada, he is an early Buddhist influenced by this early tradition, which values the state of cessation as the ultimate spiritual attainment. So these texts on debate in the early Sangha, one side of the debate, the meditative debate, has close affinities with this meditative tradition that exists outside the, the early Buddhist world. Now, Narada is an interesting figure because we have a very interesting text on him in the Sangyutta Nikaya. This is highly relevant to the debate, um, attempting to give some sort of debate to know when exactly it might have been happening. So Venerable Narada, this bhikkhu we have just seen, who values the state of cessation but cannot attain it, he appears in the Anguttara Nikaya, where he is in discussion, in dialogue with King Munda of Magadha. The text is set in Pataliputa. Very unusual for an early Buddhist text. It's clearly some time after the Buddha. According to the Pali commentaries, King Munda was the great grandson of Ajata Satu. And they give these, these years of reign as follows. Ajata Satu reigned for 24 years after the Buddha's death. Ajata Satu's son Udaya Bhadra reigned for 16 years. And then the reigns of Anuruddha and Munda, the grandson and great-grandson of Ajatasattu, last for either eight or 18 years. So King Munda's reign is ending 48 to 58 years after the Buddha's death, which occurs roughly around 400 BC, we believe. So if this commentarial information is to be relied upon, the events of this Sutta Anguttara Nikaya must take place roughly in the middle of the 4th century BC. The teacher Narada, who, has, who is showing this influence from the, the non-Buddhist tradition of meditation, he is flourishing in the mid-4th century BC. Now, if people will just bear with me, I think I can get through the rest of this in 10 minutes. I'm overloading everybody with information here, but I just want to try and finish by saying, well, what contemplating, thinking, what actually was the debate going on in early Buddhist circles? What was the, the practice of this, these non-Buddhist meditations like? Do we have any information on that? How did that differ from what was going on in the Sangha anyway? And there is information. I think we can reconstruct it somehow. So the Chula Sunyata Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, it describes a practice where a bhikkhu removes himself from the village, removes himself from people, and then focuses on the aranya, the wilderness or the forest. 
not having any people or village event in his sphere of awareness, agitation which might be caused by that disappears. This bhikkhu this, then starts meditating properly, ignoring or not paying attention to the perception of the wilderness or the forest, he focuses on the oneness dependent on the perception of earth. And this is explained by the following simile. Just as a bull's hide stretched out with a hundred pins has no folds, so too the bhikkhu focuses on the oneness dependent upon the perception of earth by ignoring inclines and descents, rivers and roads, tree stumps and thorny bushes and mountainous terrain. I miss that final word. I think what we have described here is something that is in much later classical texts, such as the Visuddhimagga, is a sort of like what is called Kasina meditation, where a, a bhikkhu will prepare a meditation object, which will be a uniform sort of visual object to focus upon. I I think, I mean, I we cannot know for sure because this is the this is a simile, this description of the bull's hide stretched out. But I imagine that this maybe would have been how this type of meditation would be practiced. The creation of visual devices to focus upon, to gain the idea, earth, to meditate upon that. So anyway, this is definitely some Buddhist version of related to the non-Buddhist stream because after cultivating the perception of earth, the bhikkhu is then said to cultivate the four formless meditations, which include the meditations associated with the Buddha's teachers, before he attains, finally, the oneness dependent on the signless concentration of the mind. So this is the non-Buddhist stream of meditation, the influence, I think, if we would dare to reconstruct it, is some sort of object-based, maybe slightly visionary or visual um, type of concentration leading to inner absorption. Now there is the final thing I will mention here now, a text which has hardly been mentioned at all, which critiques this type of meditation. And this has been discussed by Grigorz Polak in his 2009 book, Reexamining Jhana, towards a critical reconstruction of early Buddhist soteriology, an important contribution to the understanding, academic understanding of Buddhist meditation and early Buddhism. So a few key po points that Polak brings together is that the four jhanas in early Buddhism they alone are highlighted and specified, presented as the original meditative discovery of the Buddha. The Buddha attains them after a memory of attaining the first jhana naturally in his childhood. The accounts of the four jhanas contain no description of an object of meditation. What we instead have is a sort of sequence or a process. The bhikkhu, after some preliminary mindfulness training, goes off, sits down cross-legged, establishes mindfulness around the front, and abandons the five hindrances. So finally, a couple of minutes now, in the Sanda Sutta, nobody has discussed, I don't think, I don't know any other publication apart from Polak's reconstructing jhana that focuses on the Sanda Sutta. So the Buddha is, in, is teaching the bhikkhu Sanda, and he says, meditate like a thoroughbred, not like an unbroken horse. So the unbroken horse tied up at the feeding trough meditates, broods, and obsesses, fodder, fodder. On the other hand, the unbroken person, sorry, so that's the unbroken horse. 
like that, the unbroken person hasn't abandoned the five hindrances. So this person, like the unbroken horse, the wild horse, he meditates, concentrates, contemplates, and ruminates on 11 objects, which are earth, water, fire, and air, or wind, infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception, related to the two teachers of the Buddha, and then finally, this world and the other world, and what is seen, heard, thought, known, attained, sought, or explored by the mind. So the, the person who is doing it wrong meditates on these 11 things. The person who is doing it right, who is like a thoroughbred horse, he doesn't, he's not like a, um, a wild horse waiting for his fodder. The thoroughbred instead is said to abandon the five hindrances. Specifically, he does not meditate on any object. It, the, this text points this out, makes a very distinct point about this and recognizes how unusual it is. So although the, this person, the thoroughbred, has no object of meditation, it still it says the text says and yet he meditates how does he meditate by abandoning the five hindrances so the sanda sutta is contrasting two types of meditation it's saying that one type involves meditating on objects this is a type of meditation that does not require or presuppose the abandoning of the five hindrances. The sutta is not implying that you can meditate on these 10 objects and do it without the five hindrances. That's not the, still the right way to do it. The right way to do it is not to meditate on objects. It is to abandon the hindrances. So the text concludes, the Sanda Sutta concludes with the homage of the gods, a quite rare motif actually in the Pali Suttas. The gods, including Indra, Brahma, and Pajapati, worship from afar the good thoroughbred as he meditates. So they say this, homage to you, thoroughbred of men, homage to you, supreme of men, who meditates but dependent on which object of meditation we do not understand. Sanda asks the Buddha how the thoroughbred meditates without an object, so that even the gods worship him without really understanding. The Buddha does not really help. He says, Sanda, with regard to earth, the good thoroughbred's perception of earth has disappeared. In other words, this person is not meditating. He is without. I, maybe disappeared would not be the, the, the correct translation. He is not meditating on objects. The Buddha's teaching here is purely negative. It's just not like the other type of meditation of a wild horse. The motif of, by the way, the, the final thing I will say then is that the motif of the gods in the Brahma and Pajapati not, uh, of, pay, of not being able to understand this meditation, it brings to mind the Buddha's description of the liberated bhikkhu who Indra, Pajapati and Brahma cannot find the consciousness of. So possibly we're dealing with related asset, um, related uh, streams of thought within early Buddhism. So just to summarize then, what I've tried to, to show here is that the great, the, 
Bronkhorst's thesis of Greater Magadha goes against explicitly what is stated in the Pali Canon from the very first page. It is a reconstruction which avoids the evidence. If we read the early Buddhist texts sensitively, according to likely historical context, trying to draw out implicit meaning, we actually have a lot of fragments which suggest the wider tradition of a Brahminic inspired tradition of meditation. This tradition is stemming, I think, from the unorthodox world of the early Upanishads, um, especially the composers of the, the Yajnavalkya sections of the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Coming from that is a tradition of inner concentration and meditation, which is very influential in early Buddhism. Buddhism is not opposed to this as such. It, when the Buddha gains his awakening, these two teachers of meditation are described as the most eminent candidates to be his disciples. I think the early Buddhist Sangha is engaging creative, creatively with this world of wider world of unorthodox Brahminic meditation. We see that in actual situations described in some of the suttas. But at some point, this influence has caused a debate in the early Sangha. So those texts on debate between karma and insight, it is an actual real debate. It was caused by specific spiritual ideas and practices that differed in the early Buddhist world. Some of the things said about this relate the debate to the mid-4th century BC. And now in practical terms, what the one aspect of the debate is a type of meditation which is concentrating on actual objects which uh, I suppose a sort of visual focus to begin your meditation, a bit like Kasina meditation as described in later Pali sources but not in the early Buddhist texts, actually. This type of meditation is explicitly criticized by the Sanda Sutta, which says that makes the, just, I suppose there is one simple point of the Sanda Sutta. Doing this type of meditation disregards the crucial factor of abandoning the five hindrances. What type of meditation in early Buddhism focuses entirely on the abandoning of the five hindrances, it is the four jhanas, which are explicitly stated to be the Buddha's personal discovery. So that is the, the lecture today. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>